The pious sheikh, so the lewd poem began, entered into the garden of paradise in search of his divine reward. A huri hanging from the tree of the black-eyed damsels nestled inside a fruit. In early 2013, a pickup truck piled with Al-Qaeda jihadists drove into the Syrian town of Marath al-Numan to punish the man responsible for this parody on male desire, scripture and God. They arrived about a thousand years late. All that remained to be beheaded was a statue of Abu al-Ala Abdullah al-Mari, the great 11th century Arab poet. They cut off the statue's head. The front lines of the global war on blasphemy moved to India last week after two Bharatiya Janta Party leaders denounced the Prophet Muhammad. Furious Middle East regimes, as you know, demanded an apology from India. Angry protesters, battle police in Uttar Pradesh, Al-Qaeda threatened to unleash armies of child suicide bombers against India. Fearing the unravelling of ties with a region that sells India over half its oil and gas, the BJP is seeking to hush its strident anti-Islam polemicists. India's violent conflict over religious identity, which have raged unresolved since well before the colonial era, are becoming entwined with a larger global war. Free speech and religious offence began their battle in India around 1924, when the Arya Samaj activist Mahashe Rajpal published Rangila Rasool in Hindustani, The Colourful Prophet. The polemic reviled the Prophet's sexual life, contrasting it with Hindu ascetic ideals. The BJP leaders who claimed Muhammad's third wife was a child might have been unaware of the heritage of their claims. That taunt was actually a central theme in Rangila Rasool. Lower courts condemned Rajpal to prison for hate speech. Lahore High Court Judge Justice Dalip Singh, though, demurred. I quote, If the fact that Muslims resent attacks on the Prophet was to be the measure, he reasoned, then, I quote, judgment passed on his character by a serious historian might also. Aisha bint Abi Bakr's actual age of her wedding is, in fact, an issue of serious theological disputation. There could also be a serious conversation on religion and child marriage. The practice is, of course, far from unfamiliar in Hindu tradition. The age of sexual consent in the United States till late in the 19th century was 10. In medieval Europe, girls were sometimes married as young as 5. The subject of the debate in Rajpal's time, as in that of Nipur Sharma now, wasn't the right of adolescent girls though. Ilmuddin, a Lahore carpenter, eventually murdered Rajpal in 1929, the third in a series of assassination attempts targeting the blasphemous publisher. Even though the assassin was hanged, his memory still fires the imagination of Islamists and jihadists in Pakistan. Long before Rajpal's murder though, the escalation of communal tensions in Punjab had led colonial authorities to overrule the High Court and pass a new law that proscribed speech that insults any religious belief or incites hatred. Free India upheld these blasphemy laws. Lower courts, the Supreme Court once said, erred in acquitting the Tamil leader E.V. Ramaswamy Nayakar for destroying an idol of the god Ganesh. Instead, the Supreme Court said, courts ought to, I quote, pay due regard to the feelings and religious emotions of different classes of persons with different beliefs. This, the court said, ought to be done whether those beliefs in the opinion of the court were rational or not. Faith, in other words, was allowed to fail the test of reason. As the Hindu nationalist movement gathered momentum, its protagonists began pushing the state to guard their religions. In 1993, a cultural presentation involving the Dashra Jataka, a variant telling of the Ramayana where Ram and Sita are cast as siblings, was subjected to criminal action. There were successful mobilizations against James Lane's historical account of the rise of Shivaji. A.K. Ramanujam's magisterial account of the Ramayana had to be removed from the Delhi University curricula. Those campaigns continue. Hindu religious right activists just weeks ago threatened violence against Delhi University professor Ratan Lal, who mocked claims that a shivling had been found inside the Gyanwapi mosque. 
Islamic invective directed against Hindus is also common, though less politically powerful, you could argue. The cleric Ilya Sharfuddin has repeatedly railed against Hindu worship of what he describes as genitals. Zakir Naik's proselytizing programs often featured a Hindu or a Jew converting to Islam after being persuaded of its superior virtues. A theatrical device, by the way, he borrowed from American televangelical shows. The Republic of Hurt Sentiments, as journalist Mukund Padmanabhan called India, has many martyrs to many faiths. Sanal Edamaruku was forced to leave the country after he exposed the tears flowing from an icon of Jesus as drain pipe leakage. Cricket star Mahindra Dhoni was prosecuted for an advertisement invoking the Hindu god Vishnu. In general, these conflicts have not had gentle endings. Muslims have been killed by Hindus. Hindus have been murdered for offending Muslims. Purported sacrilege and heresies have led to lynchings by Sikhs. The violence that erupted following the publication of Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses in 1988 marked the globalization of the blasphemy wars. From anti-India riots in Kashmir to the massacre of intellectuals in Turkey, the book came under sustained attack. The multiple jihadist strikes that followed the publication of purportedly blasphemous cartoons by the Highlands Posten in Denmark and the 2015 slaughter in Paris sparked off by the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo built on this global project. Little imagination is needed to see why this happened. Across much of what we call the developing world, religious nationalism had emerged as a powerful political ideology to challenge authoritarian, corrupt regimes. The discourse over blasphemy, fundamentally, is a debate about political power, not about religious belief as such. Fragile nation-states responded by seeking to cloak themselves in the robes of the pious. In Pakistan, Islamists had been cultivated by the military to undermine the democratic political parties. The religious right-wing, though, used the Pakistani state's purported tolerance of apostasy as a weapon against the establishment. Eventually, the clerics there succeeded in marching the country to the edge of the theocratic abyss, riding the very donkey cart the military had once recruited them to pull. Saudi blogger Raif Badawi insulted for insulting Islam, or the Egyptian intellectual Ahmed Abdul Maher, who was sentenced for refuting classical theology, were persecuted by nation-states seeking to shore up their flagging legitimacy, not by Al-Qaeda or Islamic State jihadists. India, through this period, witnessed its own blasphemy campaign. From 2014 to 2018, an official United States government study notes, India ranked fourth behind Pakistan, Iran and Russia for the number of religious offence prosecutions it initiated. But the results are in front of us. Instead of stilling religious tensions, scholar C.S. Adak has noted, the law, I quote, gave strategic advantage to invoking or mobilizing wounded religious feelings. Laws to curb hate speech, the argument goes, are necessary to keep the peace in societies with varied but passionately held belief systems. That arguments prove deeply misguided. For one thing, as the philosopher Kenan Malik has pointed out, hate speech restriction has become a means not of addressing specific issues about intimidation or incitement to violence, but enforcing general social regulation. Legal restrictions on free speech allied over a deeper problem, which is that large numbers of people find contemptible ideas morally worthy. They don't think they're saying anything wrong. The Indian government might prosecute some hate speech, but this covers up the unwillingness to challenge the sentiments that it expresses. Importantly, hate speech prosecutions haven't ensured communal peace in India. They've engendered fear, censorship and competitive mobilization to control the state system. Instead, the law has deterred few religious chauvinists. Few serious professors, though, would today risk teaching D.N. Jha's The Myth of the Holy Cow or Wendy Doniger's The Hindus, Maxim Rodanson's biography of Muhammad called Muhammad or Reza Aslan's revisionist account of Christ, Zealot. The Indian government's action against hate speech might be geopolitically expedient, but it will end up feeding a cycle of competitive religious nationalist mobilization. 
Hindu nationalists will seek to recover their hegemonic position, while right-wing Muslims will increasingly reach out to the global religious community for support. The state and society will be mired in these competing toxic currents. Enlightenment philosophers laid the foundations for modern democracies by asserting that while human beings have rights, ideas don't. Gods, just like atheism, communism, capitalism, psychobabble, must make their case. al Mari, centuries before the Europeans, invited us to consider a world where gods might be able to take a few jokes and perhaps also take some of the criticism on board. The poet, though, wasn't an optimist. The human race, he wrote, agree or disagree, was divided into just two. And I quote from his poem, One, man intelligent without religion. The second, religious without intellect. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. <laughs>